Uh, thank you very much. I haven't seen a board like that since I was at universities. That's some time ago. So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Christopher Greenwell. I work for Elsevier. I'll get that out of the way now uh, before anybody starts. Uh, it's fairly clear from the slides, anyway. Uh, Irene Dachi did a pretty good job of setting up a lot of what I was going to say. She may even have said some of what I was going to say, actually. But so that that may mean I, I may be with you for a slightly briefer period than than was first thought. Now, uh, peer review, alternatives to peer review. Uh, I've used this slide before in the past, uh, and it's, uh, it's quite a nice slide, I think. Uh, and it shows what researchers think, and often what junior researchers think, about what will happen to their paper when it gets sent in for peer review. Uh, I especially like the guy in the hood with the chainsaw at the back. He's, uh, he's particularly good, but that's often how researchers view peer review. And this one says, the regard to the new streamlined peer review as an improvement, so goodness knows what it was before. So a little bit of background about peer review. I'll talk about some of the numbers related to peer review. I'll also talk about the beginning of peer review, which uh, if Jason Hoyt was still here, which I don't believe he is, he would entirely disagree with me, uh, because he said last night that 1665 was not the first peer journal, but it, it, it is according to the Royal Society, and who might argue with the Royal Society? So 1665 Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society was launched. It did elements of peer review. Uh, peer review became very prevalent in the 1960s. Uh, I've spent the last 10 years working on control engineering journals. Uh, control engineering had a big explosion in the 1960s. So the, the, the prevalence of what we would call modern peer review came about with mostly a lot of journals being launched. And I've picked out the key element there is really that journal was launched to register findings uh, to assure quality through peer review, to uh, globally disseminate, and to archive in perpetuity. Now, 1665, there wasn't a lot of global dissemination, but obviously these days there is. Peer review by numbers. In 2011, this comes from our Scopus database, and you can cut the numbers multitudinous ways, so others may disagree exactly with these numbers, but 2011, there were about 1.7 million research articles published in peer-reviewed journals. That includes everything Scopus indexes, which is open access, uh, and uh, subscription titles and hybrid titles and everything else. Uh, it includes uh, conference papers and regular papers uh, and review papers that were peer reviewed and published in journals, but it takes out uh, some of the letters and things like that. It works out at about three per minute, or one every 20 seconds. Uh, so while I've been saying this, in fact, the original version of this presentation did have a little timer and it, it popped up with an extra paper, but I took that out because I don't like the animations, they're a bit gimmicky. Uh, but the average peer review takes about two to four hours. There's a paper published every 20 seconds. You can see perhaps that, that those two numbers don't perhaps add up. Electronic submission and online publishing have led to, I'd call it an explosion, it is pretty much an explosion, the number of submissions and in the number of journals as well, that, because it's much easier to start a journal now. You can start a journal online, you don't need all the all the costs associated with print, like some of the traditional journals had. In 2012, there were one million research articles submitted to Elsevier journals. This is just Elsevier journals. So we, we got a million submissions last year. Uh, some of them are good, some of them bad, some of them were unoriginal. But we get about one and a half submissions every day for every journal. Obviously, some of them are very big journals, they get very badly loaded, some of them are much smaller. But on average, it's about one and a half submissions every day to every journal. So as an editor-in-chief, you have to look at one and a half submissions every single day. We have editors-in-chief, obviously, associate editors, editorial boards. There's about 542,000 uh, peer reviewers on our various databases for our various journals. All the electronic submission, submissions done electronically, all the peer reviews done electronically. So we, we can be fairly certain of that number. After review and revision, we publish about a third of those. Again, on average, it varies wildly from journal to journal. As peer review, as the number of journals has got bigger, as the internet has expanded people's awareness of them, as was said by uh, Irene, the increased volume of that means there's a lot of noise goes with that. And there are various uh, cases here. The uh, uh, Jan Hendrik Schon one is quite famous, and the Plastic Fantastic book is about that. Uh, he faked some uh, semiconductor research. He just completely made it up. Uh, he won some prizes, but... Uh, 
he, uh, he, he did get published. The uh, uh, Wusuk Kwang case uh, is in biomedicine. It's quite famous as well. Uh, but you'll also note in the, middle of, in the middle of that, there's a man sitting in an office with a large pile of paper in front of him that, that said, too few and overworked reviewers is often something we hear. And also, as Irene mentioned, you can see that uh, some of the criticisms of peer review that have been leveled over the years holds back research, it doesn't improve articles, uh, it is biased. We, uh, we often hear that one. And it's no good at stopping plagiarism or fraud. Uh, I will say, in that case, it's a lot better at stopping plagiarism and fraud than doing nothing. Uh, the number of cases over the last 10 years where a peer reviewer has spotted a, a journal paper that's been submitted to another journal and they've also been asked to peer review uh, is, quite, uh, uh, is quite a big number, actually. We, I get one every, one every couple of weeks at the moment somebody who's spotted a paper that's either already been published somewhere or has, uh, or has been submitted somewhere else as well. So I, I don't entirely agree with that, but no system can ever be uh, entirely foolproof. The other thing I'll say that I really mentioned, she talked about uh, a review of fraud, and we've also had problems with this, and there was a case recently uh, that uh, I dealt with where a reviewer was submitting, he created a number of fake accounts, and he was submitting reviews in which he asked the authors to cite one of his own papers, or several of his own papers, actually. Uh, and uh, he now has a very good uh, H-index, superb H-index, uh, but it isn't real. Uh, he's vanished, by the way. That's it. And these, these are slightly old, but as these cases came to light, uh, so the media takes notice, uh, and the mainstream media have noticed scientific publishing a lot more in the last three to four years than they ever had before. Uh, Peer review journals aren't worth the paper they're written on. Peer review broken. I, I could have picked a Guardian one here. The Guardian seemed to be particularly hot on it, but those are various, various articles from the time, and, and they're, they're ongoing now. <coughs> so what do we know about peer review? And again, uh, Irene set me up uh, rather well because she talked about the Sense About Science uh, uh, survey, which I'm also going to do. I'm actually going to use it. Uh, it was conducted in 2009, so it's a couple of years out of date now, but we found that, from what I know about peer review, from the editors I speak to, from the people I've dealt with in the control engineering uh, field, that actually that still holds true for the most part. And these, th the results of this survey are still pretty much current for the control field. For other fields, perhaps less so. They selected 40,000 researchers, 4,000 completed the survey. There was a previous one in 2007, there was one in 2009. Was there a more, is there a more recent one than that? Yeah, there were, yeah. So. so what did that survey say? Well, it said broadly that the people they surveyed were fairly happy with peer review, that 69% uh, were very satisfied or satisfied uh, with, with the peer review process. The uh, large blue bit and the little green bit uh, show, show people who are very satisfied. So in general, uh, peer review, people are reasonably happy with it. But it isn't a panacea. The word panacea was used yesterday morning. I thought I would get away with being the only person here to use the word panacea, but unfortunately, I, I, I got trumped by, uh, I think it was Douglas Kell yesterday morning used the word panacea. So this, this basically asks these questions, what should be the purpose of peer review? And that's the blue bars. And what should, what, to what extent do you agree or disagree peer review is currently able to do the following? And that's the pale blue bars. So I think, should be, able to, should be able to improve papers, should be able to determine the originality of the manuscript as something that peer review should be able to do in the opinion of these researchers. And to a lesser or greater degree, they, they agree that it is able to do that. It selects the best manuscripts, it determines the importance of findings. At the bottom it says um, uh, fraud and plagiarism are the two that come up. And they, according to the survey, they think that peer review is less well-equipped, is less able to, to find plagiarism and find fraud. And often you find peer reviewers will find plagiarism or fraud just, just by chance. It happens that an editor will send a paper to someone, a different editor on, on a different journal will also send it to them, so they happen to see that the, the paper's been submitted twice. Or they happen to be sent, we, we often have cases where people get sent a paper to peer review and they'll, they'll go, I recognize that because I wrote it. Uh, and, and, and that's always, that is something that happens. Uh, so often it's a matter of luck, but again, as I say, I think finding plagiarism and finding fraud, peer review system is better set up to do it than no system at all. 
Uh, this is this is from uh, uh, from a different uh, uh, from a different uh, uh, survey, but it shows much the same thing that peer review I improves quality. That's the thing that people think it does. That's 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 the thing that, that researchers think it does. Uh, importance of originality again, plagiarism and fraud are, uh, are listed as the two at the bottom. And with the internet, we've also been able to bring in systems like uh, crosscheck, which allows us to run su submitted papers against the database of published literature. That's something that many, many publishers are involved in. So for, for my papers in control, they run, the, they run the paper against IEEE published data, Elsevier, TNF, all the various publishers that have contributed papers into that database. Uh, and, uh, and often we, we find cases of plagiarism as a result of that as well. But again, it's, it's, not, an exact, it's not an exact science, that tool, and it will improve over the, over the coming years. So, uh, can we do better? The extent to which you would agree with the following statements. Without peer review, there is no control. Many researchers agreed with that. Peer review is unsustainable. Actually, most people disagreed with that, uh, but there's a reasonable number who do think peer review is unsustainable because there are too few willing reviewers. Scientific communication is helped. That's very well agreed with. Peer review is a concept well understood by the scientific community. I think everybody here understands what peer review is and it is a fairly well understood concept. The current peer review system is the best we can achieve. It's, it, it could go either way, that one. Some people like it, some people don't. I think if you broke those numbers down, you would probably find that it was people in different fields. Some fields feel the current peer review system works very well. Some fields don't find that so much. And the same with open access. Some fields feel that open access needs to go one way. Other fields need to feel it needs to go a different way. I mean, even in even in control engineering and, and signal processing, which is the area I was managing, those two fields have very distinct views. Signal processing is much more pro-open access than, any, uh, uh, than we find in control engineering. So I suspect this, this is, is to do with different fields. So who bears the burden of peer review? And this is something I often hear when I speak to editors, uh, uh, particularly in America, even in the UK to a large degree, they say the, the proportion of reviews that we do, that Western Europe and the US does, far exceeds the level of science that we put in. And yes, that is true, and that's partly due, certainly in engineering, to the number of papers that have come from China and from the Far East. Over the last three or four years, those papers have got much better. As the papers have got much better, their writing has got better, so their ability to conduct peer review will also get better. And what you see uh, in the bottom right uh, is that actually, if you, ask, if you ask researchers in China to conduct a peer review, they aren't unwilling to. Um, you, find, you see that the top Germany and Canada and Switzerland are the average number of declines, but those people will be the people who are getting asked the most. But, people, but uh, you'll find that researchers in China are not unwilling to review, but as a proportion of the amount they produce versus the amount of reviews they do, it, it's, it's a much smaller number. And what you'll also find, I think, over the, co over the coming years is that that line will flatten out slightly, that the US will come down a touch and China will come up a touch. And then that means that some of the pressure on the system that we're currently experiencing will perhaps go away. So what does this mean to rigor? Because after all, this is about rigor and openness, and I thought I, I would better bring it back to theme at some point. Uh, it means that peer review is seen as critical to maintaining standards. It's seen as critical to identifying excellent research, or at least vaguely good research. And it's seen as critical to encouraging articles that are comprehensive enough to be reproducible. And that's, uh, that's very critical in a lot of fields, that what you publish should be reproducible. Uh, obviously, I was talking at lunchtime with, uh, with someone uh, about the Large Hadron Collider. It would be tough to reproduce that, uh, unless you have an Italian mountain spare. Uh, but for most science and most, uh, um, and, and most articles, the, the article should be good enough to be able to allow someone to understand and, and to be able to conduct the experiment themselves. So peer review is, as I see it anyway, it's my opinion, a vital part of the rigor, of, of the rigor in science. But could the system, as it currently stands, be improved? Well, we'll look at very briefly at some alternatives. Um, the first one actually is part of, part of an evolution, really. And journal structures have evolved uh, in recent years, and I've, I've seen a lot of this over the last 10 years. Uh, editorial, editorial structures have got 
larger. There's now more editors. The regional structure that we used to have in a lot of journals has broken down because you don't have to put every six copies of something in an envelope and post it to someone and post it to your nearest regional office because you don't want to spend the postage sending it to America or to, or to Japan or wherever. So uh, with electronic workflows, with electronic systems has come the ability for people like me that manage journals to be able to restructure journals to make them more efficient, to get more editors in, to widen the workload. Editorial desk rejects have also become something that are slightly emotive in some areas. Some fields don't like them. Some fields accept them now as part of the scientific publishing process. That you send a paper into an editor, he takes an evaluation as to whether it's suitable for the journal, whether it's likely to be published in the journal. And that's really how I ask my editors to judge these things. Is this paper likely to get through a full-blown uh, 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 peer review process if you send it out to two or three other people. So editorial desk rejects have become part of the system. I, some of my journals reject maybe 30 to 40 percent of their papers as editorial desk rejects. They just come in, they're unsuitable, they're never going to be published. So they, they just go straight back out. So they don't go to peer review. So it doesn't necessarily cause as much of a log jam in the system. Uh, cascades, and I will start to introduce various uh, other 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 publishing initiatives and other people's names in this. Uh, so, I mean, Elsevier, many of the other larger publishers have started to introduce cascades where they group journals together and they cascade articles between those suitable journals. And the benefit of that is, is that the, uh, all, uh, all the reviews go with the paper. So if we, we cascade from journal A to journal B, all the reviews that are in the system go with the paper. And that helps Authors, it helps reviewers because often the editor of journal B, where the paper gets cascaded to, would go to the same peer reviewers and ask them to do the review again. And we have seen that quite a lot and we have had that talked about over the last couple of days that we want to make the systems more efficient. We don't want to be peer reviewing multiple times. Uh, they have a neuroscience uh, peer review consortium. They have around 40 journals that agree to accept manuscripts from other members and they move, they move papers around. Uh, they are becoming more popular cascades, but I mean, part of the uh, part part of the way that the cascades work for most publishers is that they want to keep the content in house. So essentially, you can cascade from a Springer journal to a Springer journal. I'll use Springer. I used to work for Springer, so you can cascade from one to the other uh, rather than cascading from a Springer journal to a Taylor and Francis journal or from a Springer journal to an Elsevier journal. So. But those, those will have a benefit, certainly. Open peer review. Uh, we have uh, faculty 1000 on next, so I, I won't go into that. But uh, uh, peer J, we had Jason here. Open peer review is designed to increase the transparency of the peer review process. It's designed to remove bias uh, by allowing authors to see reviewer names. Uh, and in some cases, to allow the reviewer reports to appear alongside the paper. And I really mentioned that as well. Uh, Elsevier has tried, uh, trialed it on a couple of journals, but the uptake was low, and reviewers have a reluctance to see their names put out uh, on, on, on into the wider world. So they can be pre- or post-publication, as has also been mentioned. Uh, if, if that's the way that certain, certain fields and certain journals, it works very well, I think, but certainly in my experience, in, in my field, there's no interest from my editors in working with that kind of way. But, Already journal papers have, uh, already journals accept discussion papers, many journals accept discussion papers. If you see a paper published and you want to comment on it, you can submit a discussion paper and that, that allows you to comment on something that's been, been already published. And we do also get people who get in touch with us and say this paper is plagiarized, this paper is wrong, all sorts of things. Uh, reducing the need for reviewers, so uh, reducing the need for peer review, a more flexible system, and uh, I really talked about PLOS One, so I won't talk about PLOS One, but s there are some journals that deliberately look for papers that have been already peer-reviewed, uh, but have been rejected. Um, and there's, there's a maths example, yeah, I'm fine. Um, and, there's, uh, and there's also, I mean, these, these papers, these journals have often started out as cascades for other journals. Uh, I mean, PLOS One, I believe, was originally started as a cascade for the regular PLOS journals, which were going to be the headline journals, and it's kind of turned itself on its head. Variations on a theme, again, uh, I really mentioned uh, peerage of science and uh, rubric. 
you do the peer review independent of the journal. What you don't get with that is you don't get a readership context. You don't get a peer reviewer reviewing a paper based on whether or not it's suitable for nature or whether or not it's suitable for cell or whether or not it's suitable for uh, automatica or whatever it happens to be submitted to. So that can, be, that, can have a good th that, that can have an upside in that you're looking at a paper for how good the paper actually is rather than whether or not it's suitable for a particular audience. And as, as I mentioned, most of these initiatives have been in health and life sciences so far. Uh, researchers, uh, researchers seem to favor single blind peer review and double blind peer review. That's pretty much all of what I deal with. Actually, the majority of Elsevier journals are single blind uh, with about 500 double blind at the moment. Uh, so number of articles is obviously a challenge. Reward and recognition uh, is becoming a challenge. And how do we recognize the amount of work that peer review has put in? Uh, and Elsevier has been looking at this for many, many years. We haven't found a silver bullet yet, but I expect to be in charge of the company if I do. And also, what defines a paper? And we've had a lot of talk about data. Papers now include data sets, executable code, video, audio. How much of that gets reviewed? How much of that needs to be reviewed? And how much time does it take to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to undertake all, all that peer review? So a conclusion, uh, peer review in whatever form is still seen as vital. That's why we do it. How do we do it? There are a lot of new models. There's the uh, traditional model, which still tends to prevail. But to be honest, there are many new ways to do it. Different fields look at things in different ways. But the review needs to be appropriate for the material being considered. Drivers for change. Well, the key driver for change in peer review is going to be the scientific community, actually. Uh, and, 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 and peer review really has to meet the needs of the scientific community. Uh, I've overrun, uh, sorry, thank you. <laughs>